Well, it's it's two o'clock, John. You ready to start? I am, and thank you. I'm really excited uh, uh, to talk to you all today and and start the new year with this with this wonderful subject. I, I learned so much uh, in going back over uh, what I knew and what I thought I knew and what I didn't know at all concerning rice. Uh, it's a huge subject and uh, one that um, I, I'm, I'm anxious to talk to you about. And we'll talk about beans and lentils as we have time, but concentrate on rice. Okay, so let's let's see where we start. So uh, for Christmas, one of the presents that I got that was most valuable, uh, I mean, uh, most thoughtful, was um, a whole rack full of spices. Uh, from that area now, uh, that, that store, I can't say it, uh, but that store down uh, in, in Johnson County, I can't say that. Yes, yes, of course. And wow, these these are amazing. And the ones there on that bottom that you see over on their sides were ones that I, I threw away to replace with fresh herbs. I tell you that has improved every dish that I do in every possible way. They are such high quality, so fresh. I'm just so thankful. Everything that I've been cooking lately has just been brighter, fresher, more aromatic. And, and it, it is dramatic dramatic difference one for one difference with the time that i've been using and the french time that i was given amazing wonderful i recommend <laughs> tell tell everybody what you want for christmas is a whole spice rack to replace the things that you have go ahead please jonathan so uh i i always have long grain rice and i use it for almost every single thing but I, but then I, uh, I have an Oriental rice that I use for Asian dishes, and I have an Indian rice that I use for curries. So that's what I always have in my cabinet. They're they're not expensive. They are, they last forever. And I oh, I want those three: an an Asian style of rice, an Indian style of rice, and a neutral American long grain rice. And, and so that's just normal for me. I added a couple of really specialty rices uh, for, to, for exploring this area, uh, but I, and I'll talk about all three of them. So let's, let's get started here. First off about rice, about rinsing rice, whether you should wash rice. It's, it, it's a very difficult and complicated uh, uh, thing to describe. I can't give you any, anything other than a general rule, if, if you see your, your rice is converted or, or enriched, then it has been coated with uh, vitamins and so forth. So those rices you wouldn't wash. Some rices you wouldn't wash because it would make them uh, too sticky. Some rices you want to wash because they're very they're full of dust and that would ruin their texture. And so I just have to tell you that Every single rice has a different method for, of cooking, depending on the cuisine that you're exploring, and and follow a tested a test kitchen's recipe to the minute for the for to to achieve what it is that the uh, that is classically expected of each different type of rice. Here's a, here's a weird one. I, I just cooked it today. It, um, it's very difficult to find this rice. I'm going to talk about it. It's a medium grain rice, medium grain rice. It's American it's, as apple pie made in the U.S., extra fancy premium, U.S. number one. But this is a rice that is uh, expected for you to use in with for Mexican rice uh, or, you know, uh, a rose rojo or uh, in some cases in, in Asian rice, and it cooks so totally different than anything else, you really have to follow the recipe. And so I don't have any experiences in Asian, uh, with Asian cuisine other than, you know, eating out a lot and, and living in Asia for several years. But I, I, I never cooked these things. I don't know what is expected. And so I found, that was such a lucky find, I found 
uh, America's Test Kitchen website. It, there's a subscription. It's I think it's forty nine dollars for the year. Those recipes are tested to great perfection and a hundred percent reliability. Where and, and Julia Child's recipes are also like that. She tests. She put those recipes through a test time after time, and and took feedback from people when there were there were problems with them. You could count on them. On the other hand, uh, many many celebrity chefs have just flooded the market with books on recipes with recipes that don't work. They just don't work because they haven't tested them or they turned it over to to apprentices or something to do the work for them. America's Test Kitchen for all kinds of cuisines has really come through for me. Uh, go ahead, please. Let's talk long grain, then we'll do medium, and then we'll do um, some other specialty rice. So long grain rice, you're gonna want long grain rice, uh, especially um, jasmine rice for Oriental. You're gonna want American long grain rice for American cuisine, especially Cajun Creole we'll talk about. And you're gonna want basmati for Indian food, Indian curries, which is what you see there, a butter chicken, an Indian butter chicken with basmati rice makes my mouth water. That is a most aromatic uh, dish, air, most aromatic rice of all times. It is the gold standard for aromatic rices. Jasmine is equally aromatic and wonderful, uh, but wouldn't make sense with an Indian curry. Uh, just like it wouldn't make sense to have either one of those aromatic rices with an American cuisine, say with Creole. Wouldn't, they, they are not complementary. They are contradictory, if, if that's true of uh, food. That's an example of it. Okay, so go ahead, please. So here's, here's jasmine. Its expense is in, uh, and hard to find. Uh, and it comes from Thailand, it, Laos, Vietnam. There is white or brown. I've never used brown. Um, and But this is the go-to rice for stir fry. They, uh, It's wonderful for stir fries. Uh, and the, the ratio for it is a, a one and a half uh, to one uh, cups of rice to... Uh, let me say that the, the liquid is one and a half parts and to one part of rice and only 12 minutes to cook and it rests for 12, 10 minutes. That's a very short amount of time. Most rice, this rice takes uh, over an hour and a half. Uh, some rice have to soak all night long, but this rice is very quickly cooked. It's a wonderful aromatic rice. And I, I cooked a, a dish with it. Next, next slide, please. I cooked a Vietnamese rice side rice dish that is fabulous. I have a, a packet of recipes for all of these that I've done. This is a pilaf method where you put the rice in a pan with oil and with seasonings and brown the rice. Then you add uh, the liquid that it's going to braise in and cover it and steam it for a very precise period of time and then fluff it, and it is a wonderful, wonderful side dish for Asian dishes that you would, you would find in any Vietnamese or, or, or uh, Laotian restaurant in the world. That's a great dish. You'll, you'll love that with common ingredients, nothing, nothing special. Uh, go ahead, please. So that's our long grain rice from Asia. Here is the most wonderful stir fry, Thai, Thai style stir fry that I've ever done before and just learned how to do this. The Asian chefs uh, that I have been in contact with um, insist on jasmine and cold leftover. They want rice that they cooked yesterday and they cool it and it's aired and cooled and that's what they want uh, for uh, the classic stir fries in a very hot wok. 
And uh, this particular dish is easy to do on your cooktop at home for two and with a Teflon pan on a, on a high heat, you can achieve what the, what the restaurant chefs do on those giant, intensely hot walks. This recipe is wonderful, just wonderful. With You have to watch the, the amount of spices that the Thai chefs would, would, uh, in, would put in it. Uh, <clears throat> I went way, way back in my recipe that I'm going to, that, that you'll, you'll get, uh, you'll see I've tamed the, the spiciness of it. Thai food is the hottest food that I, hottest cuisine I know of. It, it really can be too hot. Let's go ahead. So here it is, it's a stir fry and you batch things. You do the, you do the uh, chicken uh, stir fry. You, you cook the egg, uh, set it on top of the, of the, set it aside with the chicken. You cook the onions, set them aside, and, and batch all these things. This is dish that's flavored with curry, uh, lime, sesame oil, uh, and uh, the the spices that I use in here, I believe, was not jalapeno, but uh, serrano, a serrano. So there you go. That's how to do a stir fry without uh, that doesn't doesn't burn, doesn't stick, doesn't need eight hundred degrees in gas. It does beautifully in a in a, a, a Teflon pan. And this is one of those recipes that I got from the America's Test Kitchen. That's just masterful. Just fabulous. You see in that left slide, the rice has been co cooked and fluffed and cooled overnight. And it lasts three days or four. You can do many other dishes with it. It's a great way, great, great rice to have ahead of time. Uh, and, and we don't think of, about doing that, Of, but stir fry is perfect use of leftover rice. Okay, go ahead. And that's jasmine. Now, this is confusing. Mahatma, the name Mahatma gives you the idea that this is a, that this is an Indian style of rice like basmati. Not the case at all. It's probably grown in Missouri or Arkansas or Texas, big, big rice producing states. It is as American as it can be. It's even called extra long grain. It has white rice. Um, it's been milled. Uh, it, there are no preservatives to it. It, ha it. it has been enriched with vitamins um, to replace the vitamins that were lost in the milling process. Don't wash uh, American long grain rice. Do not wash it. The cooking method is two parts of liquid to one part of rice. You low simmer it covered for 20 minutes, let it rest 10 minutes, and it's perfect. Fluff it, it's perfect. And you would use this rice for dishes where you don't want a pronounced aroma or flavor. This tastes nicely, but it, ha it has no aromatics uh, associated with it. It's just neutral. It's going to pick up the flavor from whatever you're cooking it in or with. Okay, go ahead. So long grain rice, American. And here are three dishes. We've got jambalaya on the left. We've got an etouffee on the top right. And we've got a gumbo on the bottom right. I made all three of these for my family. And that was the second or third Christmas event we had was all of these things. Here we are on the, on the doorstep of uh, Shrove Tuesday or as soon. And, um, and so you'll probably be doing some Cajun and some Creole cuisine and you would use American long grain rice for those. And, uh, that, that, that uh, jambalaya is fabulous. Let's look at the next slide. I think I've got some details on that. Oh, no, I didn't. Um, I do have uh, the jambalaya in that recipe packet. It uses um, some really specific ingredients to make, to make it have that authentic uh, 
Cajun uh, flavor and, and aroma. Now, basmati is just the most prized rice in the world. Um, it, it is the flower of, of India, and it's, there's nothing else like it. It's so distinct in its flag, flavor and its uh, fragrance. It's a wonderful thing all by itself. Don't need anything to go with it. Just have a big bowl of basmati rice. It's, it's just a wonderful dish uh, seasoned correctly. It comes from India, Pakistan, or Nepal. Ah, you say, what's this Mahatma stuff? America's favorite rice. Well, very confusing packaging. Mahatma is the largest American rice company. Rice sales in America, it's Mahatma. Every and they have a whole line of rice, all of them grown in America, except for basmati. And that is legitimate, 100% Indian grown, the highest quality. So don't let the, the packaging fool you, America's favorite rice. This is not. There are American basmati style rices. They have names like Texmati and all that stuff. But if you see basmati on a package of rice in the store, it must be from India, Pakistan, Nepal. It is not American grown, although it's sold by an American company with a confusing name. Uh, basmati uh, cooks. Uh, the ratio, again, is about one part of rice to one and a half parts liquid, uh, 10 to 12 minutes, and then it's a very short, very short rest. If a dish is an Indian style of curry, um, don't accept any anything else. I mean, in a pinch, of course, you're going to use long grain rice, but 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 don't don't put a, a jasmine uh, or an in, Oriental style of rice uh, with with Indian curry. It won't make sense. They'll miss that basmati aroma. It's the best. <laughs> it's wonderful. Go ahead, please. So here's a basmati pilaf. This is a great trick that I just learned. Um, you, you lightly saute onions in butter, then you add the basmati and you, and you sweat it until they're translucent a little bit on the edge and it starts to become very, very fragrant. And then you add uh, chicken stock or vegetable stock if you want it to uh, a vegetarian. And uh, simmer it, cover it 15 minutes, let it rest 10 minutes, fluff it, and serve it immediately. But you can store it cold. Let it cool. Don't, don't, don't put a lid on it. I mean, let it cool and air to stop the cooking. And then you can store it for three or four days and just bring it out for every lunch you have, every dinner. I mean, it, it, to have bas this wonderfully flavorful basmati pilaf right there, uh, quickly uh, heat it, uh, it is a, a gold mine of a find uh, to really make your, uh, your quickly prepared lunches and dinners uh, ahead of time. Oh, this is great. Love that trick. And this was America's Test Kitchen's trick with basmati that I learned. Okay, please. Next one. Here's a here's a basmati pilaf that's vegetarian, very very boldly flavored. There is my my family considers the very best restaurant in Kansas City to not be in Kansas City at all, but in Liberty, and it is the an Indian restaurant called Seva S E V A. It is worth the trip for you Johnson Countyans. It's worth the trip to way over into Clay County and Liberty to have an Indian meal at Seva. It is especially good. And it's one of the best rated restaurants in uh, on, on the uh, restaurant rating system. Uh, I mean, it's, it, it's a fabulous uh, experience to go over there. And they, their basmati pilaf is very much like this, flavored with cinnamon and cloves and... Uh, cardamom pods oh those are so wonderful and so this this is one of those dishes where uh, where 
honestly, it, it is it's over the top aromatic, ex exaggerated uh, seasonings with cardamom and cloves and stuff. It's exotic and um, delicious. So let's go on. Let now, those are the long grain rices um, and the the three that I wanted to talk about: one from Asia, one from the American, one from uh, from India. Now let's talk about medium grain rice, and that's what this is right here. Again, it's it, this is an American rice. This this medium grain rice. It's difficult to find. Now you'll find it in the Asian restaurant, the, the Asian uh, uh, stores, almost exclusively. Um, and you'll want this medium grain rice for uh, for several dishes that I'll talk about and that I've given you the recipes for. The texture is different once it's cooked. You will be surprised. It is a diff it, it's a fat uh, little grain of rice, and it takes a long time to cook it. Uh, and it's a little bit sticky as opposed to long grain rice. Um, and it's tasty, not aromatic. It's the texture that you're going to love. You, the first time you have it, you're going to say, you know, I really haven't ever experienced that before. It's a different experience. Um, now you would use this medium grain rice for a risotto, for a paella, for a Mexican rice, and, and um, I, I'm going to give you some examples of where you would want to seek out medium grain rice. It's worth seeking out for some of these dishes that we'll talk about. So let's see what's the next, what's the next one. A, a paella. I've been trying to make a paella at home since the 80s, 1980s. Uh, my son and I went on a bus trip with a bunch of Germans down to the coast of Brava in Spain. Uh, and uh, my daughter was going to college in Mizzou from Germany. She would graduated from high school in Germany. And my wife took my daughter back to, uh, to Mizzou. And, and there my son and I were, he was about 12 at the time. And so we thought we'd go down and snorkel in the Mediterranean Sea. And we did. And it was a trip of a lifetime we were a little bit surprised that the beaches in the Costa Brava are topless and so he <laughs> that was awkward but um we ate paella on the Mediterranean Sea and since then and I brought a paella pan home even and since then I've been trying to do it at home and it's impossible impossible it, it well, how are you going to do something like this is supposed to be done over an open fire with the right size pan. I mean, this is so impractical, this paella. You got to go to Spain and get it in a restaurant out on the Mediterranean Sea and have it there, or Valencia or wherever. But America's Test Kitchen broke the code and showed me how to do a paella in my own kitchen. I'm going to show you too. And wow, what a great dish it is. The, the, the Spaniards would tell you, well, this is a controversial dish in Spain because it's not ex thought to be high cuisine uh, in in Seville or it, it's it's a peasant kind of dish and regional um, and it's as different in day and night from one end of the country as it is the other usually has some seafood meat and poultry all three usually done with a with a, a a, an Ouroboreo, a medium grain rice, and always has saffron, paprika, and Spanish, let me emphasize, Spanish chorizo. Felix Sturmer had uh, one, one year with the culinary team. He had a Spanish, um, uh, Spanish themed uh, competition entrees. And uh, so we learned a lot about chorizo and um, just do not, ex don't confuse Spanish chorizo, very hard and dry uh, with the 
uh, Mexican chorizo, which is equally delicious, but a totally different cuisine and nothing like it. And if you try to substitute a Mexican chorizo in this dish, it, it won't be an authentic flavor at all. So insist on chorizo. I found an amazing chorizo in the deli counter at Hy-Vee. Now, what happens as you cook this paella over open fire is the bottom of the rice browns beautifully. And that is that is the texture you're trying to get the browned rice. Oh boy, that's hard to do without a sticking it to that pan like would never get it up. Uh, so Teflon is going to be the answer. Let's look at the next next slide. So the these little medium grain fat um uh, Orborio is a, is a really good substitute for the Spanish rice that's impossible to find, boyo. Um, so it's sweated there and flavored, and then it's covered uh, with the liquid, the Spanish chorizo, um, and the rice is, is in there covered with a liquid, and, and the pan is kept open, not covered, and it simmers over pretty high heat until all of that liquid is gone, the crust forms on the bottom of that. You can see that the rice is just golden with that saffron flavor. And then at the very last, while there's still a little moisture in there, you put the shrimp in there and stick stick them down in the rice and they, you know, they only took, take a few minutes to cook. And, and then that dish is fabulous and a wonderful way to cook paella, which I will always cook from now on. Uh, th this really does give you an authentic Spanish paella. And wow, what a great dish it is. If you like the ingredients, if you like spicy uh, Spanish sausage, shrimp, and chicken. Wonderful dish. Okay, next one. With a medium grain rice. Now the Mexican rice, I went to Rick Bayless for this. Rick Bayless owns two restaurants in Chicago, you know him from PBS, from his long, long time a PBS series. Um, and, and he is such an authority. He takes his, uh, well, I don't want to talk about Rick Bayless anymore, except to tell you, this guy really has done his research to try to replicate the rice that you would, you would get in any restaurant in Mexico. And uh, we, I'm so emphatic about calling this by its real name, a rose a la Mexicana or um, a rose roja, not Spanish rice. There isn't any rice like this in Spain. Um, it's a classic red tomato rice. Basically, you make a salsa and you and you add a lot of cilantro and jalapenos and cook that to perfection. Um, this recipe I got from um, Rick Bayless. After a lot of false starts, I found a Mexican rice that I really do love and I'm really proud of. So I'm, I, I'm giving you this recipe. Salsa rests, the, the ratio of salsa to chicken broth is 50-50. And uh, that's, uh, and here's how do we do the salsa. Uh, I think on the next slide, how we make the salsa. Get a cast iron pan and you ju and just brown the heck out of the garlic, the unpeeled garlic cloves. They'll go soft and aromatic in about 15 minutes. The jalapeno, just burn the heck out of that thing. Put the tomatoes with their skin on under the broiler and turn them black and turn them over and turn them black. Those are Roma tomatoes, by the way. So you don't have to wait for the, uh, to fresh tomatoes. Uh, Romas do wonderful. Um, chop the cilantro. Uh, the onions are not gonna go in the salsa. It's gonna be just the peppers, um, the cilantro and the tomatoes. And I used my immersion blender or stick blender uh, and that little cup that comes with it and, and pulse, pulse that 
salsa to where it still has some texture. And I love doing it that way rather than in a small food processor, which really is a difficult thing to clean up. And it, it th this immersion blender is the dream salsa maker. And then all of these things are combined with the rice. You brown the rice. Very, very, very important step. And a Mexican in a minute will be critical of your rice if you have not taken the time to brown the rice uh, and then add your uh, salsa and li other liquid ingredients. Um, so very important step there to develop the authentic flavor, texture, and appearance. Uh, go ahead, please. Now here's a kind of rice that I don't have any personal experience with. My, I have a, a Korean American family members and they have a rice cooker going every, all day, every day, I think that continuously, nonstop. And they eat a sticky rice. Um, it's called glutinous. And notice that it, notice the spelling. Uh, there, it is um, often confused uh, with all of the gluten-free products that there are out there. But this is a very, very sticky rice and, and called glutinous rice. And it's, it's the dish throughout Asia, every country. Uh, most people eat this every day. This is the staple rice and you see it done in a steamer that they soak it overnight and then part line a steam bamboo steamer with parchment paper and then steam that and um it it's not I, I don't have any experience with it because it's not um it's not an ingredient in in dishes that I cook it's just like having a loaf of Wonder Bread in, on the shelf. Every Asian would turn to this as its staple, but it's not aromatic, it's not flavorful, it's just their staple. But I don't know how to describe it any more than that. I don't use it, uh, it I, it's too sticky <laughs> for me. Okay, go ahead. I mean, really, it, it'll stand a spoon up. Okay, here's raw, here's wild rice, and I'm sorry. I think I think one of you has mentioned this to me. I don't remember who it was, but uh, someone is is from Minnesota over this thing, and probably considers wild rice to be, you know, a very special thing. I have a lot of experience with wild rice, and all of it very very difficult. I worked in a peppercorn duck club at the Hyatt as an apprentice for three years I was in and out of, of Peppercorn Duck Club and, and with the duck that we cooked on the rotisserie, we always served wild rice. And it was um, flavored with dried apricots. And I think it was pretty well 100% wild rice with some dried apricots in it. And maybe it was seasoned it was flavored with the duck stock, as I remember. But that was about it. And we sent portions out every single night. We, you know, we're sending out that half of a delicious ro rotisserie um, oriental flavored duck uh, out with the rice. And we got bones back from the duck, and we got almost all of the wild rice back. People took one bite or two bites and they did not eat it. It's too overwhelming. It's not, I'm sorry, but you, in order to serve a wild rice dish, you have to cut it like crazy with white rice and flavor it with fruit and nuts and fresh herbs and long grain rice maybe more long grain rice than there is wild rice in there. And if you do that, then you will tame the, that flavor. The, the experts call it a muddy flavor of wild rice. It's grown in a mud and it tastes like mud. Uh, if you 
if you do this well, this mixture of dried fruit and nuts and wild and what and long grain rice. You'll have a very nice dish to serve with game, and broiled meats, and those kinds of things. Very strong, very strongly flavored. Very pretty, very pretty dish. This recipe works for wild rice. If you go straight wild rice, you will you will find it's not it's not a popular dish. Your your guests will not enjoy it. So it really takes a lot of it takes a lot of taming to make that stuff grown in the mud taste, taste good. <laughs> Go ahead. I, I, I hope that I, oh, by the way, it is not, the, the preferred rice is not wild rice. It's not grown and picked by the Indians, the, by the Native Americans at all. It, experts think that the commercial rice, the rice that's cultivated is preferable to the rice that's grown wild. So, and it's not a rice at all. Either. It's grass. <laughs> so there you go. That's wild rice. I wanted to mention it. Go ahead, please. Ah, lentils. <clears throat> these, these are, you know, we don't use them very often. They're peas, with all due respect. They're split peas. And, um, but the Indians just do magic things with them. And, and the Moroccans and even the, even the people in Spain use them a lot. So I recommend them. Oh, boy. And I've given you that, that doll soup um, in, in the recipe packet. And I, I really uh, recommend it to you. And you could even serve it with the, with the basmati pilaf that I mentioned earlier and have a wonderful vegetarian meal. Uh, delicious. And, but you have to be very careful to get the right, the lentils that the, that the recipe calls for. The red lentil is actually the same as a regular lentil, but I think it's been milled and it's a different color and it cooks in one fourth of the amount of time. You really do want to seek out red lentils for a soup that calls for it because it will be very disappointing for you to uh, cook other, other lentils than red lentils for this dish. So let's go on to the next one. I wanted to mention beans. I grew up, uh, you know, the, my my cafeteria that uh, as an ele in elementary school and in junior high and high school had navy beans on the rotating menu, and I loved them. I grew up with them. My dad made was famous for his uh, navy beans made with ham hocks and so forth, and it's just always been a, a staple in our family. and And I've always made them in that style that that my dad and the high school cafeteria, uh, excellent dear friends of mine, the cooks in the cafeteria made. But Julia Child changed my mind totally about, about beans by introducing me to Boston baked beans. And boy, is this a great dish. This is wonderful. And, and her method, which she said some one of her readers uh, sent her, and, and she's done it, she did it every, every from then on. And once I learned it, I've done it from then on. It's a wonderful method. You just dump everything into a pot and no pre-soaking, no anything with those beans, just dump them in the pot, take a look at them, with with today's technology, you're not going to find any gravel in the beans like we used to when I was a kid, but uh, th it's worth sorting them out to just to take a look at them on the counter and then dump everything in the pot and cook it all night long. I mean, 14 hours and the ingredients in there caramelize. You don't see that in regular Navy beans. You don't see any caramelization, a browning of the beans, but with this long, slow cooking, it, 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 it 
the, the longer you cook them, the better they get with that caramelization, the sugar in there browns. Wonderful dish. So aromatic. And um, so let's look at the next, next one. I think I've got, I think I talk about it more. <clears throat> it does not use a ham hock. And I love ham hocks for that old style of, of navy beans. And I'll show you a recipe for them later. But right, you don't want, I mean, a ham hock, there are good brands of it and, and bad brands of it. Those little dry things that are shrink wrapped in the store don't have any meat on them. They, I don't know, they, the flavor is like liquid smoke to me. It's not, it's not a delicious thing. I remember ham hocks, fresh ham hocks, it sounds like an oxymoron, but they were smoky, lots of meat, and delicious. And the ones that we see shrink wrapped in the grocery store don't lend themselves to a long, slow cook. And they don't, there's hardly any meat on them at all, mostly bone. So I went to Frick's ham steak, and right at the end of Julia's Boston baked beans. I add a little bit of Frick's smoked ham. That's really been a nice addition. The other ingredients that are unique to Boston baked beans is dark molasses, Dijon mustard of all things, thyme, dry thyme, fresh ginger. It just adds a wonderful, wonderful uh, aromatic and very flavorful thing. The garlic, of course. And, and my addition of Frick's. These beans are a wonderful meal. And Julia uh, suggests that you eat it with some dark bread that I never make. And, and it, it, it's a Boston tradition. And uh, I, I don't do that. I think cornbread is perfect with this dish. Boston baked beans, okay. And, and the next one, please. Next slide. Okay, so here is the bean dish that I grew up with, and um, it, it is uh, served in the, uh, you know, at the Capitol every day. Uh, it has been on the menu for a long, long time. It, it does uh, require a ham hock, sautéed onions. Navy beans are not maybe what you think. Navy beans are small beans, not the great big northerns, smaller beans. and uh, um, this is it. This is a very, very nice dish. Um, if you get some browning on the onions, if you have a good ham hock, a nice low, slow, nice, uh, slow uh, cooking until the beans have softened uh, well. But let me tell you, this is an explosive dish. And it does not cook long enough to get rid of those digestive, the digestive problem with beans. But Julia's recipe, if you cook those beans overnight, all night long, you can serve them with confidence and not have any ill effects from them. A short cook, a, a bean that's not blanched, like boiled and then allowed to sit in that water thrown off and then, um, and then cooked is going to uh, not, not digest well. So the longer cooking method really will make uh, this dish more palatable. <laughs> um, okay, let's go on. Now, refried beans, it, it, this is, I went back to Rick Bayless for this. I read a lot about refried beans. I love them. But Mexican cooks don't, don't boil beans and, and make, they buy beans. Mexican restaurants, they buy refried beans. And that is a wonderful, wonderful uh, and vegetarian brand. Those are delicious. 
no preparation needed. Now you can add some sour cream and, and certainly if you put good cheese on them, uh, that, that enhances them. But that is, that is a gr look for that brand of refried beans and serve them with pride when you're having a Mexican uh, meal of, uh, of authentic Mexican rice and this and refried beans with the um, with a good cheese um, that is a really really a nice dish highly recommend that brand and uh, for for all of your Mexican meals very very good okay let's see what I got next here uh, here's a trick I learned over the holidays again my my son's a chef as you know 30 years of experience and and every time I cook around him he teaches me something I didn't know I love it um, we had leftover mashed potatoes from one of those two or three uh, Christmas dinners that we had and he quickly grabbed up the ex the leftover mashed potatoes and rolled them into uh, a loaf tightly with two or three layers of a plastic wrap on them and put it in the uh, refrigerator. And he said, tomorrow, just uh, slice it and saute them in a little butter. And there are our potato pancakes so easily done. You know how difficult it is to make potato pancakes and forming them. It's the wrong texture. They fall apart. They don't turn well. They don't brown well. I mean, they're still good, but here is a here was a trick that was just an aha moment for me, and I love it. And now I can't wait to have leftover mashed potatoes to make potato pancakes with the next day. <laughs> I wanted to share it with you, which had nothing to do with beans and lentils. Okay, let's go. Let's see what I got next. So all of these things, all these dishes that I cooked, I, I tried to cook every single thing uh, recently that even though I've been cooking some of these things for 40 years, I look at them differently now that I have better cookware, I have better a better cooktop. Um, I, I, I am able to get better ingredients in some cases. So I wanted to look at all of my old standby recipes anew. And also I used to cook for a whole lot more, I'm much bigger. Now I'm cooking uh, just for the two of us. And I, almost everything I cook is four portions and we have it for the next day's lunch. But, uh, but anyway, all these things that I've been cooking, I, I lend themselves to beer. Uh, curry, what's better with curry than beer? What's better than Indian spice dishes? What's better than Cajun food with beer? <laughs> it's wonderful. And I found a Spanish beer of all things. It was another Christmas present. That beer is golden. It's delicious. And it's from, of all places, Spain. And of all things, it's gluten-free or reduced gluten. And um, a delicious and wonderful beer. And, and then along came another uh, brand, Omission, which is American. And they have wonderful, uh, again, uh, gluten-reduced beer. Now, if you don't uh, aren't on a gluten-free diet, you you know don't need to don't need to get these things. But if you do have someone uh, who you want to serve, who uh, who prefers or needs a gluten-free beverage. There are great ones out there and the reasonably priced is really surprising. I, I spent so many years in Bavaria. Um, my standard for beer is very high because of, I lived in Bavaria for almost seven years and I tried to drink beer from every Bavarian brewery over the seven years, I failed. I failed in that mission. I did not achieve what I wanted to. I need to go back for another seven years. Maybe I could get through all the beers over there. But they're, they're for me, the world standard. And these uh, 
I'm glad to see I can now since I can't uh, I can't have gluten in my diet. Um, that's not a fad thing. I, I mean, I, that's for me. This uh, gluten um, is uh, you know it's I can't do it. I mean, it's health. It's a health problem for me. So to find a wonderful beer like this, I'm so thrilled. Okay, let's see the next one. Um, I want to talk to you a little bit about knives. Um, my that set of knives down there, except for that metal handled one, that's a Japanese knife. But those ones are the black handle uh, like this are Wusthof, a set that I got 40 years ago. So those knives have been used. I didn't use them at work, uh, but I've been using it at home for 40 years and they have stood the test of time. I, I, if your knives at home are dull, your first temptation is to take them to Ambrosie's or one of the other, I'm sure over in Johnson County, there's a, there's a, a store that sells high-end knives and they probably sharpen them for you. But, but what they do in those stores, especially Ambrosie's, which, which sharpens knives for all the kitchens in Kansas City and most of them, professional kitchens where they go in and grab up all 40 knives out of all the drawers and take them down to the shop and grind them down and, and, you know, leave, leave 40 more. Uh, they don't, you know, they, they don't, and they, those knives rotate all over Kansas city, but when they do their quick grinding, they grind the little bolster down on, on the knife that is the little flare on the outside of the handle. And they'll grind that down and ruin the appearance. And then they will just, they will grind the knife down to where it's bowed. And we don't need that. As, as uh, for, our, for our family and our cooking, we don't need to, to take it to a professional knife sharpener and have them ground down we just don't use them that much. get a, instead get a wonderful sharpening steel like this and i recommend that you get the one from your line of knives because the steel will match the hardness of the steel and the hardness of the sharpening steel will be a good match and we're not going to take any edge off of there. We're not going to grind it with a sharpening steel. All we're going to do is realign the edge. And with just a couple of strokes, your knife will be right back to the, to the degree of sharpness that you like. So just put the sharpening steel on a towel or something where it won't move, hold it steady and vertical, and then try to make some thin slices with your knife down the edge of the of the sharpening steel like that. Three or four times is all you have to do. And you have realigned the edge of the knife to where it, it's, it's very sharp. Is it scalpel sharp? No, but you don't want that because that, that is a very fragile edge that will, that will very quickly dull it, just that you can feel it dull, uh, a very, very, very super, super sharp, fine edge like that won't last long at all. And you'll be back with the steel. So that this is more than sharp enough. It will peel a, a slice of tomato skin without stabbing it or anything. It will slice a tomato skin. It will slice everything you want just very nicely. So I recommend it. The, this is from the same line out of the same case as all my other knives. It's 40 years old, old as the hills, as my mother always said. And um, it's not a fancy handle. And it's, I think this model today is $39, even though it's Wustoff. So, but they have a high end one. If you want one to the handle matches and for the elegance and the wow factor for people to come into your kitchen, see your knife block with, with really, really elegant knives. They've got those steels too, but they don't do any better than the $39 one. So I wanted to mention this. And then I got a couple more um things uh, first off on the top right there is that stick blender that i told you about which which i found out over the holidays comes apart and you could probably put that bottom part in the dishwasher if you wanted to i have never done that but it comes apart and saves room in the drawer that's pretty handy 
And it comes with that wonderful container, which is just perfect. Everything is in motion. Everything emulsifies so quickly in that. The measurements on the side are great. That container is several years old and it just looks like new. And I just run it through the dishwasher. I do, I puree everything. I, and I, you know, like I showed you on the, on the salsa, that was a wonderful container for that. I love my stick blender. And I often, often have the stick blender stuck in the, in the pot of soups and stuff. The doll soup that, that I give you, the puree it with the, with the stick blender right in the pot, right on the stove. <clears throat> it's a great tool. Uh, I mentioned to you a couple of talks ago about cooking sausage on aluminum foil in the oven. Uh, I do that, and it's uh, and if you buy pre-sliced sausage, it, the appearance of it is uh, is better and it's good. I got two more of of the uh, spatulas, silicone spatulas, for Christmas again. Uh, that very small spatula, and then that great big huge round one. I named the great big huge round one. I will has one purpose in life. I, I, I honestly, I would I would take it to the basement. It's so doggone big, doesn't even fit in the drawer. It's great for pancakes, unfortunately. I, or or I I would have uh, probably regifted <laughs> that spatula. It's so doggone big, and it's made by that same company that I told you about whose name slips my mind, but uh, uh, we've talked about it before. Um, so those are nice gifts and, and uh, really, really came in handy. I think I've got one more slide. Okay, so um, back, back to the America's Test Kitchen um, subscription. These, these serious, serious culinarians have done all of these recipes with great scientific, uh, they, they have been very precise in all of their measurements and all that stuff. And their, and their recipes achieve what would otherwise you would not achieve if you didn't follow their techniques very carefully. I, I have 100% confidence in, in everything uh, now, since I've tried about 20 of the, their recipes over the last six weeks or eight weeks, I love their recipes. And I don't care whether you're talking about Italian. They, they, I found a recipe in there for deep dish pizza. Deep dish pizza is two days of work a uh, very, very difficult, Chicago style, very difficult, technically difficult thing to do. They have mastered deep dish pizza. They have mastered all the Italian cuisine, all the Asian cuisine that I've ever been interested in. And this is, this is a great resource. I, I recommend it. Um, I, I really recommend it for you. It, it's open things. I, 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 you know, rather than Googling, uh, and trying uh, just to hit or miss online to find a recipe for something that I want to do. Now, I just absolutely, the first thing I do is go to America's Test Kitchen and see what's their take on this particular dish, like paella. That was just such a such a lucky find for me. So uh, that I, that's what I want to mention to you. Um, it was it was great to be back with you again this year, start the series again, and I have... Uh, I have to really put my thoughts together about uh, what to do next. I've been thinking about chocolate uh, and and other desserts, the classics like Madeleines and some other classic desserts. So maybe maybe we'll do some desserts next time. Uh, Although I don't think that it has wide application now that I think about it. So any, any questions of me or any comments? Love to hear from you all. And we'll, we'll post the, uh, the, main, the recipes. And uh, so good to see all of you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan, and all. Good to see you. Happy yeah. New Year.